Now let's turn our attention to the Word of God. Uh, for those that are visiting, we've been going through a series that we titled Housekeeping. The title of the series was Housekeeping. And we've been looking at the book of Malachi. And the reason why we're looking at the book of Malachi is Malachi gives us a template of questions we can ask ourselves so that we can know what we need to pay attention in where our lives are concerned. There are four things that come out in the book of Malachi. The first one is God being our master. So the question we're asking ourselves is, who is my master as we do housekeeping this month? Second is, what is my ministry? That's the second question we asked ourselves. Last Sunday, we asked ourselves, how is my marriage? And today, can I hear you say finally? Okay. Finally, we can ask ourselves the question we really want to ask ourselves. And what question is that? Where is my? Where is my money? I know that's already a national conversation. Uh, but that's what we're going to be asking ourselves. Because from the book of Malachi, it comes out very clear, clearly. Now, before we continue, I just want to ask us, uh, you know, the, the question, how many here have money issues? Okay, how many feel like you have a money issue? Okay, I'm just curious. I mean, maybe I'm not talking to, you know, anyone that is like me. How many, how many have no money issues? None at all, you know? Uh, okay, very interesting, okay? <laughs> either you, either you know, either you are asking yourself, I don't think I earn as much as I would like to earn, or maybe you spend, or you're asking yourselves, how much you spend, or you're asking yourself how much you either save or not save, how much you give or not give, uh, but many times the big money issue is how much we have lost there, eh? you know? Could you just help me one second? Turn to your neighbor and tell them your money issue. Don't give them the testimony. Uh, you know, just, this is my money issue. What is your money issue? What is your money issue? Just tell them, my money issue is this, Okay. My money issues. Now, if you're seated next to your spouse, please don't tell them, my money issue is here. Please. Please, this is not your opportunity uh, right now. What is your money issue? We all have money issues. What is my money issues? Now, do you know that statistics say that we spend 50% of our time thinking about money. We spend about half our time thinking about money, how we can get it, how we can spend it, how we can save it, how much we need it. We spend so much time thinking about money. Money is our constant reality because we are constantly handling money every single day, dealing with our needs, making different transactions. It is central to our everyday life. We're going to spend a few minutes to look at what Malachi says about our money. Now, before we get there, there's a church that was recently robbed. And this is the report that was given following the robbery. And I'm going to just quote it as it is. This is the report. We are thankful that no one was injured but it will be some time before things are back to normal. It is clear that more than one person was responsible in this robbery. In fact, there may be many people who are party to this crime. The most uncomfortable thing about the robbery is that we are certain that those who carried out the robbery are actually members of our church. It's bad enough to know that the theft has occurred, but it's hard to imagine that it is one of our own. By the way, the robbery happened in full view of the church during our Sunday services. It is difficult to get a conviction in the courts given the clever way in which the robbery was carried out. The amount is undetermined, but at the very least, it's in the millions it's reported that some of the stolen money has already been used. It's been used for vacations, uh, personal property, etc. We don't yet have a complete 
list of all the suspects, but our consolation is in knowing that God has the complete list. This report is actually the modern day translation or version of Malachi chapter 3. So I want us to read the original report, not the modern day version of this report, but the original report. Malachi, that's where we are, chapter 3, from verse, I'll read five verses, from verse 8 to verse 12. Malachi chapter 3, from verse 8 to verse 12. It says, will a mere mortal robe God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the windows, sorry, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. As we've continued in the book of Malachi, you remember Malachi began by addressing the blemished sacrifices that the people of God used to bring to God. Last Sunday, we looked at how the people used to put away their wives in divorce. And divorce had become very rampant. In the book, he also speaks about taking advantage of widows and orphans and aliens. Basically, there was a blasphemous attitude about everything during Malachi's day. And as if it was not enough, the most egregious treatment of God was that the people at that time were robbing God. They were robbing from God. How? He says, by withholding their tithe and their offering from God, by giving God their worst and not their best. The people in Malachi's day expected maximum blessings from minimum commitment. And the people in Malachi's day were asking the same question we're asking ourselves today. Where is our money? And according to Malachi, drawing from this passage that we've just read today, I would like to suggest to us that Malachi's answer to the people is God's answer to us today. And the particular verse that we are paying attention to is verse 11. God says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop the fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. According to Malachi, when the people are asking, so where is our money? According to Malachi chapter 3, their money was being taken by pests that were devouring their crops, and their money was being shaken when the fruit that is not yet ripe on the trees would fall and get destroyed. So I suggest to us that this is our answer today. Where is my money? It is being taken and it is being shaken. And I pray that God teaches us from this passage about where our money is. Number one, your money is being taken. Malachi says, your money is being taken by the devourer. The devourer. Pests devour crops before the harvest. A devourer is that which eats. It's that which consumes. It's that which destroys. It's that which preys on your harvest. It could be insects. It could be locusts, cankerworms, caterpillars. Name it. But a devourer is that which compromises your harvest before you actually have it. Farmers, at the end of the day, after toiling so hard, they do not have anything to show 
for their hard work because the pests have devoured the harvest. So the first thing that Malachi says, where is our money? It has been taken. It's being taken by the devourer. The second thing is, where is our money? Our money is being shaken. I call it the dropper, not the devourer. The one that drops fruit before the fruit has matured. Before the fruit is ripe enough to be harvested. The fruit in its immature state falls down and gets destroyed. And I do not benefit from a fruit that has not matured. When fruit drops before its time of harvest, then at the end of the day, I lose. In the Bible, the word fruit in the Bible is always in reference or a picture. The picture the Bible paints is always in reference to the results of something. Like when the Bible says the fruit of our labor, the result of our labor. And Malachi says we are not experiencing the fruit of our labor, our work, our harvest, because the fruit has dropped. I do not experience the result. So I suggest the same thing to us today. Our money is being taken and our money is being shaken. It's being taken by the devourer and it's being shaken by the dropper. I don't know if there are things in your life that never seem to settle. I don't know if there are things in your life that never seem to look like they mature. There are things in your life that never seem to get completed. There are things in your life that never seem to materialize. You feel that there's a lot of prematurity in your plans. It's not quite working out the way you hoped and intended. Maybe you have a leak in your financial tank and Malachi is saying the reason for the leak, the possible leak in your financial tank could be the devourer. I don't know if some things sometimes seem that they don't work out. Things are just going wrong for you one after the other. Maybe it's a car or a gadget or a machine. Somehow seems to always break down. Or you're in a place where your property somehow always seems to get stolen. Or you're in a place where accidents are seemingly too frequent for you. It's not normal. Or you have medical issues that never seems to end. Or you have so many job losses, you're not holding on to anything. Or you're in a place where you have elusive business opportunities that never materialize. They never come to fruition. Malachi is suggesting that it probably is the devourer or it is the dropper. Anything that destroys your harvest destroys your joy. A wise farmer does not only plant. Malachi is telling us a wise farmer does not only plant, a wise farmer also secures the harvest from destruction. Because sometimes there are harvest destroyers. Sometimes we come to the place where we are anticipating a harvest, but because we did not secure the harvest, we did not protect the harvest, the harvest is compromised. And you get to the place where you never actually enjoy the fruit of your labor. All you experience is a waste where the harvest is concerned. Now, I need to put a disclaimer. It's not always the devourer or the dropper that is the cause of our misfortune. Okay? And I need to make it clear so that we understand the full counsel of the word of God. You remember the story of Job. Job went through so much misfortune and yet he was a righteous man that honored God and worshipped God. God used his misfortune for God to show the genuineness of his faith. God was putting Job's faith on display. He was giving a spectacle of a righteous man that will never abandon him even though he walks through the most difficult times. God was using Job as a trophy to honor him and to glorify him. Sometimes God uses difficult times in our lives to be able to refine us, to be able to grow us, to be able to mature us. Let me put it this way. Sometimes God uses it for character development. 
He uses it for character development. He uses those difficult and challenging times to refine us. And he allows it to come, not because we have not been faithful to him, but because he wants us to become better. He wants us to grow and to mature. So the point I'm making is, it's not always the devourer. It's not always the dropper, but Malachi says it could be. It could be the devourer. It could be the dropper. Malachi gives us a strategy to handle it. If it is the devourer or if it is the dropper that has taken your money, Malachi says there is a strategy that you can be able to combat harvest destroyers, that you can be able to combat devourers, to combat droppers. He says, and it's a simple word, tithe. Tithe. The word tithe comes from the Hebrew word that means a tenth or the tenth part. What Malachi is essentially saying is this. Practicing or faithfully practicing tithing is honoring the God of the harvest. And he says, by tithing, you are honoring the God of the harvest. You are honoring the God of the harvest by giving him your first 10%. You're giving God honor as the God ultimately of the harvest. Now, the, the principle of tithing was not introduced by Malachi here in Malachi 3.10, although it's probably one of the most popular verses on tithing. But I want us to know that the principle of tithing is a spiritual, biblical principle that continues on throughout the Old Testament. In fact, let me put it this way. Abraham commenced it. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 20, the Bible says, Abraham gave God a tenth of everything that he had. Jacob continued it. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 20, he says to God, of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. This was Jacob's commitment. He continued what his father had his grandfather had initiated. Then Moses commanded it. In Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30, it says, a tithe of everything from the land belongs to the Lord. Here we're just finding Malachi confirming it. He's just confirming a biblical principle that has been practiced and has continued on one generation after the other for the children of God. In Malachi 3.10, God says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room to be able to store it. God, through his word and through Malachi, does not just give the principle of tithing. He gives both the promise of tithing and God says, yes, I have given you the principle. Remind my people the principle, but also remind them my promise. This is God's promise. God's promise is twofold. In verse 10, God's promise is that he will give you a harvest. If you're faithfully giving, if you're faithfully tithing, God's promise is clear. He will give you a harvest that you don't have any room to be able to store. But God also promises that he will protect your harvest. Not just give you the harvest. In verse 11, he says, I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops. He clearly tells us that he will prevent the fruit from dropping before it matures. For many of us, our problem is not that we don't have money. There is so much money that has gone through your hands. From January till now, there is, you have handled so much money. But the only problem is right now, I don't have too much to show for it. For some of us, you think you're not millionaires. But you are a millionaire because a million shillings has passed by your hands. The problem is, I just don't have a million shillings to show for it. And many times it's that. It's the fact that I cannot keep it. I don't have a million to show. I don't have the money to show for it. But there's so much that has passed me through. There's so much that has passed by me. Give God the 10%. That's what Malachi is saying. 
Give God the 10% because God can do more with the 10% than you can do with 100%. Give God the 10%. Honor the God of the harvest. Honor him with what he has entrusted to you. He can do more with that than I can do with 100%. Some of us think when God demands 10% of us, or when God demands maybe a day in a week, 10% of all our income, or one day in the seven days of, of the week, that it's actually only 10% that belongs to God, or it's only the one day in a week where we come to worship and recognize the Sabbath day and treat it as, as holy and gather together in worship. God does not just own one day in my week. He owns the seven days. And as he asks me to give 10%, he does not just own 10%, he actually owns the 100%. All that God is asking me to do is to acknowledge that he owns all of it. You know the reality is this, eh? 50 to 100 years from now, everything that you own will be in somebody else's hands. 50 to 100 years from now, your land, your home, your assets, the truth is this, we do not own anything. We don't own a single thing. We are merely stewards of God's resources. We are merely stewards of God's resources for a season. And those resources will be passed on to another steward very, very soon. They'll be handed over to somebody else to be able to take care of. The act of claiming Ownership over someone else's property is known as robbery. And we are guilty. Google any dictionary, they'll tell you that this is the definition of robbery. Claiming ownership over somebody else's property. God has simply given me temporary custody of the money that I currently have. God has simply given me temporary custody of the business that I'm running, of the car that I have, of the phone that I have, of the land that I have, of the house that I have, even the kids that I have. I am just but a custodian. He has given me temporary custody of my knowledge. He has given me temporary custody of my skills. He has given me temporary custody of my body. God has given you and I temporary custody and you and I are simply caretakers. We are caretakers of God's property. When you give 10% to God, you are simply taking your hands off of what ultimately belongs to him in the first place. That's exactly what you're doing. And Malachi is saying it's a statement of removing your hands on what ultimately belongs to God in the first place. The practice of tithing is a good reminder of who is in charge. The practice of tithing is a declaration of who is in charge of my life. You're making a declaration of ultimate ownership. And that ownership is God. You are acknowledging. You are recognizing. You are making a declaration that God owns everything that you have. You're saying, it is not my knowledge. It is not my wealth. It is not my education. It is not my networks. It's not my skills. It's not my abilities. It is God's. And ultimately, it belongs to him. 90% of your income with God's blessings will still go further than 100% of your income without God's blessings. Tithing releases God's blessings. Tithing faithfully is what Malachi is telling us that God is calling us Two. Now the question, the question that we are asking ourselves is, can you remind me the question again? What is the question for today? Where? 
Now, I want to suggest to us that that question is fundamentally wrong. It is fundamentally wrong. The right question that we need to ask ourselves today is, where is God's money? Not where is my money? And this, I just want you to see the implication. When you recognize that it is God's money, then you are giving God the responsibility to preserve it. When you recognize that it is God's money, then you are giving God the responsibility to protect it from the pests and the devourer. And God is saying, if you could only acknowledge that it is my money, then what you're doing is you're giving me the responsibility to protect it because you've declared that it is my money. When you recognize that it is God's money, you're giving God the responsibility to preserve it from that fruit dropping. But what ultimately God is telling us in his word is, if you recognize that it is your money, then take responsibility to both protect and preserve. And I kid you not, I'm already doing a bad job at it. And you and I can attest to it. God is saying, give me. Give me the responsibility to protect it. Give me the responsibility to provide and, and to be able uh, to preserve it. How? By acknowledging that it is all mine in the first place. How? By practicing faithful tithing. You're acknowledging that it is God's. Joe Stowell says, it's not so much what you have, but rather what has you that makes the difference. It's not what you have, but it's what has you that makes the difference. I started by telling you that tithing commenced with Abraham. Tithing continued with Jacob. Tithing was commanded by Moses. Tithing was now in this passage confirmed in Malachi, but I would like to close by reminding us that tithing was completed by Jesus. Jesus completed this message of tithing. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus speaking, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He says, you should have practiced the latter. You should have practiced tithing faithfully. You should have practiced the latter without rejecting the former, without rejecting justice and mercy and faithfulness. Jesus took the Pharisees to task not because they were not tithing. Jesus took the Pharisees to task because of how they were tithing. And Jesus reminds us that these blessings and these promises do not simply come to you because you are tithing. These blessings and these promises come to you because you are tithing in the correct way. Jesus told the Pharisees, your tithing is not from your heart. Your tithing is from a legalistic, a legalistic point of view. He says, it must come from your heart. They no longer cared for people. They no longer even cared about God. They were just doing it because they had to do it. Let me put it this way. God looks at the heart, not the hand. God focuses on the giver, not the gift. Because the attitude that you give is more important than the amount that you give. The Bible reminds us of this woman that gave a penny in the temple. It was her sense of generosity, her sense of sacrifice, her desire to honor God, her desire to worship God with everything that she had that touched the heart of God. God looks at your heart. He's not looking at what you're giving. And regardless what you give, what matters to God is your heart. The point we're making is tithing does not begin in your wallet. Tithing begins in your heart. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much money you give. 
If your heart is bankrupt, then your life is empty. It's not the figure in your account. It is the configure in your heart that matters. It's the inclination of your heart to acknowledge his lordship. It's the inclination of your heart to walk in obedience with him. It's the inclination of your heart to acknowledge that he owns everything that matters more to God than what you have. Malachi 3.10 is the only place in the Bible where God gives us the opportunity to test him. It's the only place in the Bible where God says, Semangwe. It's the only place in the Bible where God tells us, let me prove myself to you. That's what the word test means. The New Living Translation says, try it. Let me prove it to you. Prove something is true. Why don't you let God prove himself to you as you faithfully tithe? I want to challenge us as members of Nairobi Chapel on Gong Road. If you are not faithfully tithing, God is saying, Semangwe. God is saying, prove it. Prove that I can protect. Prove that I can preserve. Prove that I can preserve from the dropper. Prove that I can protect from the devourer, the pests. Prove it by acknowledging me in charge of everything that you have. Give me the responsibility. Let me do it better than you're doing. Let me be in charge. Acknowledge that I own everything that you have and see if I will not take my responsibility and do it well. That's God's challenge to us. Tithing needs three things as I close. One, connectivity. Connectivity, tithing is personal. It comes from the heart. It's not about your wallet. Tithing is relational. It's not transactional. Tithing demands a connection between you and God. An acknowledgement of who God is in your life. Two, tithing needs consistency. It needs consistency. As soon as you receive it, give it to God. As soon as you receive it, release it to God. By doing that, you are immediately acknowledging and declaring God's lordship over your wealth. God's lordship over everything that you have. To say, first, I'm going to begin with God because it is his. Before I acknowledge any other need, before I take a step else, I'm beginning with God to say that it's ultimately his. It takes consistency. I am totally blessed by many members here at Nairobi Chapel that have made a commitment to tithe daily. There are people here in the retail business and they've said, as soon as I close the day, and I have closed whatever sales I've closed that day. I will tithe whatever I have. There are people here that give every single day. There are people here who give weekly. Some give monthly because that's when you get your income. There are some here that give annually. They're in the agriculture industry and they get money based on agricultural seasons or seasons like that. And they give. The point I'm trying to make is it's not about when you tithe. It's about doing it consistently. That's what matters. That God knows that he's consistently acknowledged in charge of what you have. The third one is tithing needs calculation. Calculation. God gave us a figure, 10%. And the reason why he gave us 10% is it's big enough for you to feel the pinch. It's big enough for you to feel that it is sacrificial. Because remember when we started this series, we said when we are giving an offering to God or a gift to God, for it to be worthwhile, for it to be valuable, it needs to be sacrificial. And God gives us a picture like 10% because when you give 10% of your, in your income, you feel the pinch. It needs to feel sacrificial so that it can be valuable. Some of us ask the question, so should I tithe from my gross or should I tithe from my net salary? There's a friend of mine who answered this question for me very well. Many, many years ago, he told me, do you want gross blessings or you want net blessings? So you, Jijazir, you fill in the blanks. The point he was making to me, it's not about the amount that you give. God knows your heart. God knows whether you're acknowledging that it's all his in the first place. At the end of the day, you're acknowledging the one who ultimately owns 100% of your salary. It's his. 
but he gives you 90% to use on your needs. And he says, use the 10% to remind yourself who it ultimately belongs to in the first place. Malachi tells us we need to tithe to the storehouse. What is the storehouse? The storehouse is the church where you worship, the place where you get ministered to, the place where you serve. And that is where you need to tithe because that is where you belong. That is where you are participating in helping that community of believers fulfill God's purpose for them. And he says, if you belong to Nairobi Chapel, Ngong Road, that's where you tithe. There is offering that you can give as a donation. Maybe the church that is your church of origin at home or a church or a, a, a cause that you're part of, a passion that you have, all those are donations. And God is saying those are offerings. God is saying that's a product of your heart of generosity that he acknowledges and he continues to bless. But he said, the tithe needs to go to your storehouse, the place where you get primary nourishment. Offering is everything outside of the tithe. Anything extra over and beyond the tithe. Every Sunday, you give an offering even though you had tithe. At the end of the month, you give an offering or a donation to a cause or to something over and above the tithe. But the point I wanted to make here at the end is, under calculating, is don't just calculate what you're giving. Don't just calculate what you need to give. I want to ask you to now calculate God's blessings in your life as a result of your faithfulness, as a result of acknowledging who ultimately owns everything. Start calculating. Now buy a calculator because God says the level of blessing he releases to those that faithfully tithe to him from a heart of true acknowledgement of who God is in their life, you will not have any place to be able to store it. That's the nature, the bountiful nature of the faithful God that we serve. He is able to sustain us. I'll end with this quote that was on a tombstone in the UK. On one of the tombstones in the UK, it's written, What I spent, I had. What I kept, I lost. What I gave, I have. And I think this summarizes it. What I gave, I have. And I pray that truly we become bountiful in what we have because it is a product of what we have given to acknowledge the Lordship of our God in our lives. I'd like us to conclude our time together by sharing the Lord's table. And the reason why I'd like us to do this is to use this as a time of commitment. You may be here, and God has laid it on your heart to make a commitment with him today to become a faithful tither. Maybe you've been tithing, but you've not been tithing consistently. Maybe you've been tithing, but not from the right heart. And God is asking you today to make a covenant with him. God is saying, Semangwe, let me prove myself to you that I am a faithful God. And if today you want to make that covenant, I'd like to give us the opportunity to do that as we share in the Lord's table. Because the Lord's table is a sign of God's generosity to us. God did not withhold his one and only son, Jesus Christ. God gave you his best. Why don't we give him our best? And as we share in God's best, as we share in God's greatest gift to us, I pray that we can make a covenant with God to tell God, I am who I am because of you. I have what I have because it is yours. And today I want to dedicate it back to you. I make a covenant today that I will acknowledge your lordship and your ownership by my faithful giving. I will make a consistent statement. It could be daily, it could be weekly, it could be annually, monthly. I will make a statement that you own it. But you're basically telling God, take charge. Take charge of everything that I have. I pray that in today's communion, we can tell him, take charge, Lord. Take charge of everything that I have. Prove yourself. 
prove yourself as a God that is faithful, even as I faithfully give to you. I'd like to, for us to bow our heads and make that commitment to God. Let's bow our heads and make that commitment to God as we prepare ourselves to be able to share in the Lord's table. I pray that today the Lord's table will not be like any other because you're making a very special covenant with God in the area of giving. Let's just go before God as we acknowledge him. And if you're here and you're making a covenant with God, just lift up your hand wherever you are. I want to give you the opportunity to do it before we share in the Lord's table. Just lift up your hand. Thank you. Just lift up your hand where you are and make that covenant with him. Tell him, Lord, I make a covenant with you to faithfully, faithfully tithe. I pray that, Lord, would you allow me to experience the bountiful blessings, but also to experience the place of God taking full charge and full ownership over what I have. I want to spend the next few moments to just rebuke the devourer in our lives. Everything that is called by your name. Father, I come before you, O God, and we appropriate this word in Malachi chapter 3, verse 11. We rebuke the devourer, the pests that have been taking that which belongs to you. Even today, as we acknowledge it is yours, we release you to take full responsibility of protecting the harvest from the pests that many times come our way. We rebuke the enemy, we rebuke the devourer, and we pray that the harvest now be released to full term. The harvest, O oh God, be released to your people, that your people will truly experience the fullness of a God that is faithful. Father, if our fruit has been dropping, we rebuke the dropper in the name of Jesus Christ and we command that that fruit will go to full term. We command that that fruit, O oh God, will mature. We command that that fruit, O oh God, will be complete and those plans, whatever it is that we've laid out before you, because they are ultimately yours. So Father, will you take your rightful place of protection? Would you take your rightful place of prevention and allow us, O oh God, to experience the God that says, I will prevent and I will protect your harvest. Prevent it from the pests. Prevent it from anything that would come to devour and protect it from falling. Father, we cover each and every person that is making a commitment to you. And pray that today as we share in the Lord's table, we truly make a covenant today with you, O oh God, that will allow us to acknowledge you as king and ruler in charge of everything that we own. So, Father, we ask that would you now take charge? Would you take charge over all that we have? And would you allow us to be faithful stewards to that which you have entrusted to our care? We declare you as owner. We declare you in charge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you could go ahead and remove the top seal, the upper seal. Uh, if you had not picked up the elements, they are still or at any of our pillars, uh, so that we can be able to partake together. Uh, if you are not here yet, just go ahead and, and, and walk up to our pillars. So kindly remove the top seal, if you could reveal the wafer, and then you can also remove the lower seal and reveal the drink, so that we can be prepared uh, to partake of the Lord's table uh, together. So on the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Would you take this in remembrance of me? Shall we together partake of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ? And after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, This cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink of this cup, and whenever you eat of this bread, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. This cup also represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for our forgiveness. The Bible says there is now no condemnation 
to those that are in Christ Jesus because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for my sin and for all my shortcoming. So if you're here today and you're feeling guilty, you're feeling condemned because you have not been faithfully giving, you have not been faithfully tithing, would you today partake of this cup as a reminder that we serve a God that is merciful? We serve a God of second chances. We serve a God that can allow you to open a new chapter in your life where tithing and giving and honoring and acknowledging God is concerned. So would you partake of this cup of mercy, this cup of forgiveness, this cup that fully and totally restores because of what Christ did for our sins? Shall we together partake of the cup? And so, Father, we ask that would you allow us to open a new chapter where our faithfulness as stewards of what you've entrusted to us is concerned. I pray that as from the covenant that we have made with you today, from the commitments that we had made, would we truly walk this journey of stewardship and be true beneficiaries of the outpouring of God's blessings in our lives. We command that blessing to be our portion as we walk in obedience to you. We bless your people as they begin this journey of faithfully giving. We bless your people as they continue the journey of faithfully giving. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, for all of us, regardless where we are, we will truly experience the God that says, let him prove himself to us. So would you prove yourself to us as a congregation as we continue in this journey? We now bless you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the love of God, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you.